Royal Navy Yard, the new Queen of the Fleet is commissioned with top brass from the Secretary of the Navy on down, present for the notable occasion. Captain Robert Stroh takes command of the 60,000-ton carrier USS Saratoga, the biggest and most powerful vessel afloat. Special attention was given crewman's comfort in her design, which also provided unmatched plane handling facilities, key to her striking power. The new Saratoga, sixth Navy vessel to bear the name, would dwarf her World War II namesake with its giant flight deck, five city blocks long, one block wide, and its complement of 100 jets and crew of 3,500. The greatest one-ship concentration of naval power ever built. Truly the new Queen of the Seas. Prince Rainier's yacht bears his betrothed in triumph into the harbor at Monaco. A few hours earlier, Grace Kelly of Philadelphia and Hollywood stepped aboard the Deo Giovanti from the liner Constitution, which carried her across the Atlantic. A picture queen who will become a princess greets her new subjects and is greeted by them in turn as she goes ashore to a tumultuous welcome. The little postcard principality wears its heart on its sleeve, its feelings expressed by two small monogasques offering flowers. From far or near, all eyes are on this old world city and its bachelor prince, who wooed and won him a leap year bride in the new world. Through streets decked with American and Monacan flags, he whisks her off to his pink and white castle on the eve of the wedding of the year. Famed Mount Etna, snow-covered, and during recorded history, one of the landmarks of the Mediterranean comes alive again as guides from a safe distance watch the awesome spectacle of its eruption. Dormant for many years, it shoots streams of lava hundreds of feet into the air. There is reason for the apprehension, for in ages past, Etna has brought terror, death, and destruction in previous eruptions. But here, a howling blizzard also threatens a photographic party seeking to film the interior of one of the craters. Flames and ice, the eternal riddle of Mount Etna, tempestuous sentinel of the Mediterranean. An 80-year-old landmark in Vienna goes up in smoke as fire of undetermined origin consumes the ancient stock exchange. Built in 1877, it was one of the scenes of many famous European financial transactions until the Nazi invasion, and one of the finer examples of Viennese architecture. All through the night, the fire rages out of control, consuming the beautiful colonnades for which it was noted. After the coming of peace to Austria, the building was used as a merchandise market. Doomed to be demolished, the ancient building, scene of much 19th century history, leaves a void in Vienna's colorful downtown district. First look at the Starfighter, newest member of the Air Force's Century Series of Advanced Supersonic Combat Planes. This is the F-104, powered by a new and more powerful jet engine. The Lance-like craft has other new features, among them the first downward ejection seat system for a production jet fighter. It flies on thin, straight, razor-sharp wings, this so-called aeronautical bolt of lightning whose operational altitude is the stratosphere. Described as the most advanced plane of its type, the Lockheed Starfighter goes through its paces. Defense Department films record the premiere of a new star blazing in the sky. San Francisco State College, an all-out campus blood drive, brings the gift of life to one student, Jim Garner, who, despite his need of a daily transfusion, has married, has a healthy, sturdy son, and is earning a college degree in social welfare. His fellow students have already given 500 pints of blood to keep in check the rare form of hemophilia that requires a pint of fresh globulin daily to prevent agonizing, eventually fatal bleeding. This day is the supreme effort, San Francisco State's graduation gift to Jim Garner, 200 days of life. Jim's problems aren't solved for good, but it's a great assist to bolster the rare qualities of courage and good cheer that have carried him this far and won so many friends. The Pan-American Union pays tribute to the late Cordell Hull, 
Isabel and Marcella Delgado, daughters of the chairman of the Council of the Organization of American States, unveil a bust of the Nobel Prize winning Secretary of State, the architect of the good neighbor policy. Milton Eisenhower speaks as personal representative of the president. The Western Hemisphere honors a man whose achievements transcended the politics of his time. Eight thousand fans in Tokyo's Metropolitan Gym see a thrilling wind-up of ten days of table tennis. In the mixed doubles, an American team on the far side pulls the big surprise of the world's championship. Point for the Americans. Their opponents are top-seeded Ivan Andriadis of Czechoslovakia and Anne Hayden of England. That's mixed doubles indeed. 17-year-old Erwin Klein of Los Angeles and Mrs. Leah Neuberger of New York are the only Americans to win a cup during the 10-day tournament. Set and match point coming up. While the British gals return and misses the table, it's all over about the shouting and the hugging. In Tokyo, New York loves Los Angeles. They coast to coast it to victory. of the Navy of tomorrow, the USS Boston, America's first guided missile cruiser in action off Cuba. From below deck magazines, its potent terrier missiles are automatically positioned on launching racks. Ship and missile were designed for each other in what engineers call an integrated weapon system, lethally efficient. This cruiser mounts no big guns. One of its missiles can sink any enemy ship or with an atom warhead smash an enemy base. A full salvo can be aimed and fired in seconds, guided to target while in flight. With the advent of the USS Boston class, the guided missile comes into its own at sea. The new combat punch of the surface Navy. This is Hudsonville, Michigan, after the tornado. Hudsonville, worst hit by a two-day series of storms that struck with unpredictable fury across 14 states in the nation's midsection. 13 were killed in Hudsonville, 17 all told in Michigan, 8 in Wisconsin, 5 in Oklahoma, 4 in Tennessee. Total, 43. A massive cold front moving eastward triggered the treacherous twisters, killer winds that come with the spring. These were the worst in 36 years. The cold front also stirred up the worst dust storms within memory in West Texas and a crippling blizzard in the Dakotas. But the tornadoes were the worst. Ask the living in Hudsonville. They escaped with their lives, but not much else. Spring is a time of new life, but where a spring tornado strikes, death walks the land. Is this a creature from outer space trying its land legs on planet Earth? No, it's a robot weather station being tested at the Naval Research Laboratory for use in the Antarctic. It's nicknamed Grasshopper. Ingeniously, it stands up, raises its own antenna and other devices for weather recording. Plans how to drop it by parachute onto the polar ice cap. Once in operation, the battery-powered robot transmits via radio vital data on wind speeds, temperature, pressure, and other weather information. Its signals can be heard 800 miles away. The data transmitted is received in code on a tape recorder. If a thing like this makes the weatherman obsolete, we'll be blaming bad weather on a grasshopper. Or is that cricket? Ten horses of the United States Olympic jumping team are loaded aboard a transatlantic plane for their trip to Stockholm, where they will compete in June. Representing the United States are four riders, Frank Chapote, William Steinkraus, the captain, Hugh Wiley, and Warren Warford. Besides competing in the Stockholm Olympic events, the Grand Prix team will also be entered in subsequent meets in Copenhagen, Aachen, Germany, London, and Dublin before returning home. The valuable steeds are carefully secured in their stalls for the 15-hour flight. Many laurels to their credit, the flying horses and equestrians have high hopes of bringing an Olympic first home with them. Film star Grace Kelly, surrounded by a milling crowd, arrives aboard the SS Constitution for her trip to Monaco and her marriage to Prince Ranier. 
Bedlam awaits her at the shipboard press conference. I hope for a large family, says Grace. I can't get a word in edgewise. Bon voyage, Grace. America wishes you happiness. Doubly burdened by parachutes and bulky parkas, 700 paratroopers board their planes at Thule Air Force Base, Greenland, for exercise Arctic night. It's a long way from home for the 82nd Airborne, winding up two weeks of sub-zero training and indoctrination with the first airborne operation north of the Arctic Circle. The Joint Air Force and Army maneuver brings to the highest peak modern tactics for combat at the top of the world. Something new for this frosty wasteland where mere survival has always been a full-time job and warfare unknown. But war today is no respecter of geography. The mock battleground is a frozen fjord, a layer of ice 55 inches thick. Sounds cold, looks cold, it is cold. Here's how to keep warm when they stop moving. Dig snow shelters, simple and effective. The outcome of exercise Arctic night, victory for the airborne over the world's least livable terrain and climate. The greatest show on earth opens its 1956 season at Madison Square Garden with traditional gaiety and glitter and the breathtaking artistry of lovely Pinita Del Oro, featured in the aerial ballet Mexicanorama. Appearing for the first time in America is the balancing wizard Titos. He uses his head and manages to get along nicely. Japan's Takeo Yusui scales the slack wire to the very apex of the big top. The climax, a death-defying slide for life, a highlight of the show. A new year and a new Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus carrying on in the grand old tradition. This grim and forbidding Arctic waste, a top priority defense project is being rushed to completion. Known as Operation Dew Line, due for distant early warning, it is the construction of a string of radar bases. Building in these frigid latitudes becomes a test of men and machines. Almost every type of terrain is encountered from ice hundreds of feet thick to Arctic tundra. The thickness of the ice must be tested for landing strips and radio towers must withstand howling Arctic gales. On a tour of inspection of top secret bases, U.S. Secretary of Defense Wilson is joined by Defense Minister Capney and Defense Production Minister C.D. Howe of Canada and other members of the Joint Commission. The vast undertaking will cost a half billion and take two years to complete. These watchdogs stretching 3,000 miles across the Arctic are the price North America must pay for security. They will sound the first alarm should an air attack come. First films of the Snark, intercontinental guided missile that already has been flown as far as 2,000 miles. With rocket boosters blasting, the Northrop Snark heads out over the ocean. Once it reaches top speed, the awesome missile drops the rocket boosters, cruises along on its jet engine. When the boosters hit, duck. The pilotless missile uses an automatic airborne guidance system to find its destination, regardless of weather or time of day. A piloted jet rides herd during the long-range test flights. Tomorrow's missile will leave the plane far behind and far below. 
President Eisenhower presents the Young American Medal to Patricia Ann Strickland of Atlanta, Georgia, for bravery in dragging her mother from the burning wreckage of the family's private plane when it crashed on landing. Patricia Ann was only 12 then and weighed barely 60 pounds. She was unable to save her father, also trapped in the wreckage. Nearly two years later, her exceptional courage earns national honors and high praise from the chief executive for a remarkable young girl. Jacob and Joanna Miller, 95 and 97 years young. Today they celebrate an event that comes to few people, their diamond wedding anniversary. They repeat their wedding vows once again in the presence of their fellow lodge members gathered for the anniversary celebration. Even as they near the century mark, Mr. and Mrs. Miller retain their zest for living and the party in their honor. This is the house to which they came as bride and groom 75 years ago and where they have lived ever since. Here they still lead active lives with their marriage certificate occupying a place of honor in their home. The automotive industry takes another giant step forward as it unveils an experimental gas turbine test car. The problem of heat in the turbo has been finally solved in this compact motor, which has a fifth as many moving parts and weighs 200 pounds less than the conventional engine of similar horsepower. Here is a graphic demonstration of the low exhaust heat. As an acid test of the new automobile, it is started from New York on the 3,000 mile run across the continent, during which it will face all possible driving conditions and temperatures. After performing smoothly for the entire trip, the turbo arrives in Los Angeles. George Hubner, inventor and designer of the car, gets the reward for success from starlets Mara Corday and Lee Snowden. It's a very swanky crowd that gathers at the St. Vincent Casino for a very swanky showing of summer fashions, latest offerings of Italian stylists. The feminine eye is quick to spot the little novelties and niceties of overall design, setting the offerings apart from last summer's dresses, hats, and accessories. For sportswear, slacks and shorts are still in vogue and draw a sigh of anticipation from the onlookers. The utilization of stripes is not neglected, nor is an eye-catching handbag to make her the belle of the ball. Summer shorts with modish millinery in either black or white make it a matter of choice, but then choosing is the fun part of it for some gals selecting a summer wardrobe. If she chooses the wrong one, well, there's always another summer, and by then, styles will be changed again. The detachable or convertible sports dress finds new favor and new fans. She's right in step with the times. Italian fashions come up with new triumphs. Ken Venturi, the amateur, tees off at Augusta, four strokes up on his nearest rival, Kerry Middlecoff, defending champ in the Masters Tournament. No amateur has ever won. Eight strokes behind Venturi going into the final round is Jack Burt, Jr., personable veteran of the pro circuit. The gallery is rooting for the young San Francisco amateur, but gives the defending champ a hand when Carey sinks one. But the big story is Venturi's collapse and Burke's rally, climaxed by this terrific shot out of the trap on the final hole. A little English puts him only four feet from the cup. Ken Venturi captured the hearts of all who followed his fortunes, but Jack Burke Jr. holds out one stroke up to win the title and $6,000. Partner Mike Suchak is first to hail the new master of the masters. He wears the green coat of victory as Bobby Jones offers congratulations. A pro is still champ. first H-bomb to join the United States and Russia as ranking atomic powers. 
The thermonuclear device was fired high over its target in the Christmas Islands, keeping fallout at a minimum. But the test added heat to the mounting debate over the safety of atomic tests and came to on the eve of renewed disarmament talks between Russia and the West. With a limitation on further atomic tests increasing in possibility, Britain has staked its claim to full status as a nuclear world power, perhaps none too soon. shocked by one of the bloodiest episodes in Algeria's grim and bitter 31-month-old struggle between France and Muslim nationalists seeking independence. This is Malouza, a small native community after the raid in which every male over 15 was lined up en masse before rebel firing squad. These few escaped the raid that signaled a new wave of terrorism in Algeria. Nationalist spokesmen answered denunciations with countercharges of French atrocities, and both sides called for the sympathy of the outside world, which saw ravaged Malouza as symbolic of the savage conflict in which Muslim slays Muslim without mercy in the cause of Arab nationalism. The president's new helicopters practiced landings on the White House lawn in preparation for the job of ferrying Ike between his official residence and National Airport. The president was playing golf at the time, but members of his staff watched the whirlybirds go through their paces. One will airlift the president above the Capitol's crowded streets, the other will carry a Secret Service detachment. One other possible use for the White House helicopters, evacuation in event of emergency. Israel reveals a two-sided Arab policy with a helping hand to its own Arab population, chiefly nomads who have settled down to farming, a painfully poor and hard existence in the harsh Negev desert. But a brighter future is promised by new harvesting combines provided under a government aid program. Despite the skepticism of the oldest inhabitants, new farm machinery and training in soil management will make the desert bloom for Bedouin tribesmen. A huge throng, estimated at well over 100,000, jams Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn for the Model Flying Fair. Home-built replicas of conventional craft and also jet planes are entered in the competition with prizes worth $10,000 for the winners. The air was filled with the buzzing of tiny motors, and one little speedster was clocked at 163 miles an hour, and that's fast for some real planes. Here comes Wrong Way Corrigan. As dawn breaks over Nevada, the 1957 atomic test series begins. The test followed a 12-day wait for weather conditions which would keep fallout at a minimum and scored a complete success. But the series will range from this baby blast with only half the power of the Hiroshima bomb to the most massive weapon tested on this continent. Background for this series of tests, increasing controversy over the dangers of fallout, with the Atomic Energy Commission coming under mounting criticism both abroad and at home. At stake are grave world issues. The breath of another century drifts into the port of New York with the arrival of the square-rigged, three-masted Norwegian training ship Christian Radic. Time turns back as the 200-foot vessel sails proudly up the harbor. One of eight square-riggers still in service, the Radic was sunk by the Nazis and refloated after the war. This is her third New York visit, and on board are 42 teenage cadets getting their first taste of the sea. It's on Project Vanguard, which will set an artificial satellite in space circling the Earth, is revealed at the Martin Aircraft Plant in Baltimore. A full-scale model of the 21-inch moon and a model of the Vanguard rocket, the 20,000-ton three-stage missile that will carry the satellite to its orbit, where it will broadcast priceless scientific data to Earth. The first glimpses ever permitted of the Vanguard assembly line show the mighty rockets nearing completion. Soon the first will be test fired, while the actual satellite launching is scheduled before the end of 1958. A daring first stride into outer space. Vanguard 
Test Vehicle 2 stands on the launching pad at Cape Canaveral in the Navy's second attempt to place a satellite into orbit. In its nose, a grapefruit-sized metal sphere. A huge rocket, three stages of liquid fuel components, is actually still experimental. For Vanguard, every flight is a test flight. Vanguard 1 lost thrust only four feet off the pad and crashed. That flaw was corrected, but in Vanguard's tens of thousands of delicate parts, its miles of electrical circuits, there's room for lots to go wrong. And the slightest malfunction at this stage means this. One circuit in the control system breaks down and Defense Department cameras record a pinwheel of fire. Another disaster for Project Vanguard. <laughs> Despite a sore throat, President Eisenhower holds his second White House press conference of 1958 as scheduled, with comment on his own voice as well as on world affairs. In my vocal cords, it would be very helpful to me if you'd ask very long questions that could be answered yes and no. <laughs> uh, John Scott was so good. Uh, in his latest letter to you, uh, Premier Obama opposed a foreign minister's conference because, as he put it, uh, of the uh, balanced position of certain possible participants. Uh, what do you think of this remark? Well, I uh, rather thought he must have been talking about Gamico. <laughs> but I will say this. We're working very hard this morning. In fact, I have an appointment with the Secretary of uh, State this afternoon to see whether there is uh, any possible approach that we can make what will be appealing and uh, which might lead under uh, after proper preparation to some kind of need. Atomic weapons come to Korea in a dramatic gesture by the United States to counter the red buildup north of the 38th parallel. On the scene, the Honest John rocket launcher, field tested and operational, and the 280 millimeter atomic cannon. is noteworthy too as one of the last reviews held in Korea by General Arthur Trudeau, now First Corps Commander, due to succeed General James Gavin as the Army's Chief of Research and Development in the Pentagon. In Korea, the Army's top missile man deploys the weapons of the rocket and atom age to redress the balance of power. On the 10th anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi's assassination, Day-long memorial ceremonies demonstrate that the name of India's great spiritual leader has lost none of its power. Prime Minister Nehru places an offering on the flower-heaped memorial platform that marks the site of Gandhi's cremation, a national shrine. Nehru is joined by every ranking political figure for the occasion, which was marked by an historical exhibition spanning Gandhi's life. An ambulance corpsman in the Boer War Later, in the years when Gandhi was at once nationalist leader and the conscience of his nation, a world-famous figure for his successful passive non-resistance to British rule, and finally, a martyr slain by a Hindu fanatic. In memory of Gandhi and his personal austerity, Nehru and other national leaders spent hours at the spinning wheel, still disciples of the Mahatma, India's great soul. At Bad Gastein, Austria, the World Ski Championships, a field of 78, represents 24 countries. Bud Werner of Steamboat Springs gives the best performance by an American in the history of the championships. Werner takes fourth place in the slalom and remains a contender for the combined title with good prospects in the two remaining events. In the first heat, Igaya ends slowly and finishes third.
Among the most massive launching pads at Cape Canaveral are those of the Atlas missiles, enormous looming structures over 150 feet high. Their concrete pedestals stand a good two stories. From one of these pads 18 months ago, the first Atlas blasted off to explode into fragments. Last week, another soared over its full intercontinental range. Now, the most far-reaching feat of all is in the offing. Fueling has gone without a hitch. Every component checks out flawlessly, and the 10-hour countdown goes into its crucial final moments without any substantial delay. The launching area is cleared. The periscope of the control center blockhouse is unsheathed, and in the massive concrete safety dome, the core of technicians is a muted beehive of activity as the seconds tick away. Of these men, only a handful know the actual course plotted for the Atlas. It's a secret held by 35 men in the entire country. Even the test conductor who actually pushes the firing button knows only that the missile will go its full range. foot missile goes aloft in a near perfect takeoff. Fully loaded to a weight of 122 tons, it hurtles upwards before the enormous thrust of two rocket boosters and the main sustainer engine. Four and a half minutes of powered flight bring it to satellite velocity, 17,000 miles an hour. The missile's own guidance system steers it into orbit, the first time this has been done. With a weight of 8,800 pounds, the Atlas is by far the biggest satellite, more than double the mass of Russia's Sputnik 3. But impressive as is the feat of the Atlas itself and the awesome accuracy of its guidance system, all else is overshadowed by the amazing communication system it carried aloft. The Atlas can receive messages from Earth, record them, and rebroadcast them on a command signal from the ground. A revolutionary new method of space communications was pioneered and given overwhelming dramatic emphasis with the master stroke. The broadcast of President Eisenhower's voice from space. A message received and rebroadcast through all the world. Said the president, through the marvels of scientific advance, my voice is coming to you from a satellite circling in outer space. Through this unique means, I convey to you and to all mankind, America's wish for peace on earth and goodwill toward men everywhere. Here is how the president sounded in his broadcast from the Atlas. This is the president of the United States speaking. Through the marvels of scientific advance, my voice is coming to you from a satellite circling in our space. Through this unique means, I convey to you and to all mankind America's wish for peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Outside Havana's present outside protests, the executions will continue. In the White House, President Eisenhower signs the proclamation that makes Alaska's entry into the Union official, nearly 92 years after Lincoln's Secretary of State bought the territory from the Russian Tsar for $7 million. In the years since, Alaska has yielded well over a billion dollars in new wealth and moved steadily but slowly toward statehood. Now the President's signature makes it officially the 49th state. At the same time, Ike solves one problem created by the added state. He announces the new design of the flag. And across the country, manufacturers go into action, bringing the stars and stripes up to date. The problem of the 49th star has been solved by a field of seven staggered rows of seven stars each. And while it is not mandatory to replace 48 starred flags now in use, the manufacturers hopefully look towards a boom in business as America rushes to keep up with the new look of old glory.
24 years and 50,000 flights ago, the China Clipper left San Francisco, headed westward on the first scheduled flight across any major ocean. The classic flying boat was luxurious for its day, not bad even by current standards. Over the then under construction Golden Gate, westward toward Hawaii, Guam, Wake Island, destination Manila, and history. Today, 50,000 Trans-Pacific flights later, the 50th state Hawaii celebrates the historic anniversary. The hula is unchanged, but the Trans-Pacific run is no longer an adventure, it's routine in less than a generation. Fashion holiday on the fly. Arriving in the colorful Netherlands Antilles for an island interlude, the gals are traveling light, for their wardrobes relying not on quantity, but on the versatility of the new Canadian synthetic to get the most fashion mileage with the least luggage. Can do? Uh-huh. Starting with coffee on the terrace, overlooking Curacao's rare blend of 17th century Holland and West Indian foliage. The gals are relaxing in cool house coats, full length and shorty models, respectively. Quick change for a picnic on the unsurpassable beach at Aruba, a brief interlude, bikinis for every taste, lace embroidered or boldly striped, and tailored from the same miracle fiber as the rest of the gals' travel wardrobes. Evening sees the cycle complete on the terrace in cocktail dresses of Rivoline, and pretty as naturally a picture. According to a careful observer, with an eye for attractive compositions, namely me. Come sunshine and warm weather and the zoo comes into its own. The official greeters, in full dress of course, are on the job, conscious of their importance and out to make a splash for the benefit of the visiting kids. young ones are up to their own brand of mischief. One baby monk beside seals are not his kind of playmate. Mama! Now this is what you call monkey business. This character really swings. Even the lioness gets to feeling kittenish. Man disapproves. Grouchy as a bear, whatever the season. The big cats are downright playful, but the kitten, well, she figures the tigers are in another league altogether. It could only happen in the children's zoo, where all the animals are friendly and the kids have a ball amongst the mixed up four legged panhandlers. Kids meet kid. Ooh. to a missile production line. An ultra-modern plant outside Detroit plays host to military representatives of a dozen NATO nations. Here in two million square feet of floor space, parallel assembly lines turn out the Jupiter and the Redstone missiles. Problems of complexity and fantastic precision required for quantity construction of ballistic missiles have been solved. As many as 300,000 parts go into one missile. The writers and attaches can carry home the message to our allies that America is truly keeping pace in the missile age. Aloha means both farewell and greetings, and Hawaii bids farewell to 40 years of frustration and failure in attempts to win statehood and joyously greets its new status as a full-fledged member of the Union, its 50th state. It's a banner occasion for the islands which will rank as the 47th state in area, midway between New Jersey and Connecticut. The United States border is now within 3,900 miles of Tokyo, land of the hola of sugarcane and pineapple with its polyglot population, brings a colorful culture as its heritage and contribution. Perhaps most important of all, Hawaiian statehood gives the lie to communist charges of American colonialism. The big day was a long time in coming, which means that much more to celebrate.
Vice President Nixon's tour of Poland and the popular enthusiasm that greeted him in many areas, despite lack of notice in the press of his schedule. Over a quarter of a million lined Nixon's route, overshadowing by far Poland's recent reception for Khrushchev. Dramatic and eloquent evidence of the popular temper here in what is comparatively the freest of the Iron Curtain countries and where the demands on the Vice President's talents in tact and diplomacy were possibly the greatest of his entire tour. On arrival back in Washington, Mr. and Mrs. Nixon received a triumphal reception. First to greet them as they left the plane was daughter Julie, 10. Her sister Patricia stayed home with back trouble. A crowd of nearly 4,000 thronged the airport, including most of the White House staff and nearly every Republican congressman and senator. But there is no partisanship in Mr. Nixon's speech. The people of the Soviet Union, and even more the people of Poland, who lost one out of four citizens in World War II, have suffered a great deal in wartime. And they desperately want peace just as the American people want peace. We have been tremendously moved by the welcomes that we have received in the countries we have visited. But as we return, we have the same feeling in our hearts that we have had upon returning to the United States from other trips that we have taken abroad. The best part of going away from the United States is to come home again. Vice President concluded with a plea that America show Khrushchev the same courtesy on his coming tour that he had received in the Soviet. Mr. Nixon then went directly to the White House to report to the President. Here too, a sizable crowd waited to cheer him. With the President's brother, Dr. Milton Eisenhower, who was on the trip, Mr. Nixon gives Ike a first-hand account of his talks with red leaders, the dramatic prelude to the upcoming exchange of visits by Ike and Khrushchev, and may signal a new diplomatic era in the Cold War. Explorer 6, the panel wheel satellite shown before launching. The vanes jutting from the two-foot sphere contain tiny cells to convert solar energy into power for the Explorer's battery of radio equipment and instruments. Carried into orbit by an Air Force Thor Able rocket, the satellite will measure the Earth's radiation belts and magnetic field. And perhaps most impressive of all, we'll relay back crude pictures of the globe and its cloud cover from the vantage of outer space. Launching is flawless. Man's 14th space messenger to date goes into an elliptical path 150 miles from Earth at its closest, 26,000 miles out at its farthest point. The panel wheel satellite will remain in this orbit at least a year, continually drawing electricity from the sun's light to power its unique eye in the sky, probing the mysteries of the cosmos. On the steps of New York City Hall, a moment from the past is relived. Gertrude Ederly is there again, smiling for photographers, much as she did 33 years ago, when the big city paid her tribute for the big swim. It was August 27, 1926, when the 19-year-old Trudy returned from England as a national heroine. She had conquered the English Channel. Only five men had ever done it before, but Trudy's time was two hours faster, and she was a woman. The roaring 20s never were louder, and New York's reception was overwhelming and historic. This was the city's first ticker tape parade, setting a precedent for the Lindbergh reception the following year. In 1959, Gertrude Ederly is an active businesswoman, still interested in sports, especially swimming. But 1926 belonged to her. Trudy, alongside fabulous Mayor Jimmy Walker, the toast of the town. On the
the Jersey City waterfront, one of the Port of New York's most spectacular blazes. A conflagration touched off by a chemical explosion kept going like a chain reaction by a continuing series of minor blasts. Exploding drums of chemicals were hurled hundreds of feet in the air as firemen battled in 92 degree heat to contain the blaze. Looming clouds of smoke and fireballs were visible and audible across New York Bay, while to the west, a New Jersey Turnpike extension was fogged out by smoke. The scene is only a few hundred yards from the still-remembered Black Tom explosion of World War I, among the most catastrophic harbor blasts of all time. Minor in comparison, this blaze is serious enough to fell 21 firemen. After four hours, the inferno is reported officially as contained, but it is still a scene of blazing peril.